Shadiversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome back to Underappreciated Historical Weapons, and in this episode we'll be looking at War darts, also known as war javelins. This is one of the things I love about underappreciated historical weapons because there are so many weapons that people, when you think, when you see them, you're like, what, this, this really was a real historical weapon? Because look, it's basically a giant arrow. Yeah, you know, arrow, bow and arrow, ramp it up in size, okay? Something you hold, something you throw, yeah, that's what we're talking about. Now, as to the terminology, well, there doesn't seem to be an official distinction for it, which is why I was like, war dart or war javelin. People really haven't decided definitively what to call it, because a dart is something you throw that has kind of fletching and, you know, a metal point, and so ramp that up in size, like a warfare equivalent of it, well, it would be a war dart. But in contrast to that definition, a javelin is you know, a long shaft, like spear object that you throw and war javelins, war darts, they're thrown. It just has fletching and a pointy tip to make it more applicable and useful and effective in combat, hence war javelin. So you pick what word you want to use. I'm probably going to be jumping between the two definitions because I haven't even decided what to be. Uh, darts, javelins, war, wait, yeah, yeah, that, okay. It's interestingly hard to find a lot of information on war darts because they're very obscure in the modern kind of view of the medieval period. That doesn't mean they were obscure in the past, uh, rather quite the contrary. But we'll get to that. But because information is so hard to find on it, I really need to give a shout out to Todd of Todd Stuff, who has made two excellent videos on this very subject. Now, I'm going to be kind of deconstructing the logic behind a war dart, to try and figure out where, you know, it originated from, how it was developed, and also share a bit of information how they use and stuff like that. But Todd has actually made one and demonstrates its use, and he also explores the use of a throwing string in application to war darts and how it fits in in historical context. Great videos and Todd's stuff, he is like an experimental archaeologist, all right? He is recreating medieval weapons as historically accurate as he can and uh, he just makes some awesome stuff and he has some really great videos. So shout out to him, go check him out, link in the description to his channel. Now let's deconstruct the kind of logic behind the war dart. Bring it all the way back, okay? And then we're gonna move down and return to where we would logically reach what is the war dart. So to begin with, in combat, all right, being able to dispatch your enemy, your foe at a distance is always more advantageous than having to get into close, me meaning melee, right? Because if you're in melee and they're using melee weapons, that means you can be hit back. But if you're out of their range and then you can dispatch them from a distance and keep yourself safe, that's always the more preferred option. Which means range weapons, all right? Range weapons are great. Okay, so in its most basic idea, what is the most basic range weapon that you could really think of, pick up, and use? It's basically a thrown rock, okay? Pick up a rock and throw it. But we humans, we're very industrious, strange little creatures, and so if we think of this logic, all right, throwing something good, what's a way to make this work better? In regards to the thrown rocks, well, we did develop a tool that, you know, enhanced our ability to throw rocks quite effectively, and it was the sling. Slings were actually fairly prominent and rather deadly in the ancient and classical periods, but the problem with a sling, they throw rocks. And the problem with rocks is that uh, they have a, a decently large surface area for the type of thing that we're considering here, weapons. And if they hit thick clothing, they won't do much damage. And so something pointy, where it goes to a really fine point where all the damage in force is, you know, on that tiny surface area point, which increases penetration, and that means hitting vital organs, which means much higher chance of incapacitating and killing your opponents. So pointy things, good! Okay, what's the easiest pointy thing we can find? A pointy stick! And there we go, the spear. But can we throw a spear? Well, we can, but there are other ways in which we can enhance this idea of a long pointy thing. For instance, developing a tool which converts our biomechanical energy into mechanical energy that can be apply the same force that we kind of put into this mechanical duvidaki thing, which transfers into the arrow, duvidaki thing, that's, you know, a very technical term, you've got to remember that. Transfer the energy into the long pointy thing and then bang, and so we develop an arrow, arrow, they're kind of thin, they're smaller, kind of thin, but there's a problem with bow and arrows, which kind of has existed for the entire existence of this weapon. And it's that you need to use two hands to use them, including crossbows, even small crossbows, when you load them, you can kind of one hand shot to reload to your hands. Now, why is this a problem? Well, it nullifies a vitally important weapon tool that has been used in historical combat for a very long time. Heck, we're still using today. Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Shields. So it's a bit of give and take. You'll be a bit more vulnerable if you're using this bow and arrow. You get good range, they're 
phenomenally effective, but you can't use a shield, all right? And so what if you need a shield, you're not necessarily a dedicated ranged combatant, so you have a shield, you have a weapon, but you want the advantage of having a ranged weapon just in case. So that means you need a ranged weapon that you can use in one hand. And so slings, yes, kind of, you, it's possible to reload them one hand, but again, rocks, okay? Something pointy, something more deadly, they can use in one hand. So we come back to the spear thing. Spears can be thrown, but they're not necessarily optimized for being thrown if your intention was to use them as a melee weapon because some of the big advantages that a spear offers over other weapons is reach. So you want it decently long. And then you also want it to be able to survive some pretty, you know, abusive use, especially if they're clanging up against armor weapons of the opponent. So you need the shaft decently thick and robust, which actually makes it less effective as a thrown weapon because the heavier it is, the less it has in range. And in terms of length, well, you're throwing the weapon for reach, so you don't need the additional reach on the spear itself to get additional range because you're throwing it. So, uh, and adding additional weight just increases the weight problem, which means a spear, long pointy stick, which is optimized for being thrown is something a bit thinner in terms of its cross-section circumference. Okay, we're looking at a smaller kind of circle and also shorter. And this type of spear is what is historically understood as a javelin. And javelins, of course, were used very prominently in the classical period. And what type of warriors you generally use javelins? People use shields as well, okay? Shield, one handed throwing weapon. All right, javelin, it works! And this is why the use of the javelin was still concurrent around the times when bows and arrows were being used, because it is a ranged weapon that you can use while using a shield at the same time. It's a one-handed ranged weapon. And in regards to reloading, you don't need a second hand. If you have one, you know, available, strapped onto your back or on a loop or something like that, you throw it, you can pull it out, and then you're good to throw again. And it can also double as a fairly effective melee weapon as well. Not as effective as like a full-blown war spear or something like a war spear that's, you know, an animal anachronistic term, you know what I mean. But still, it's a long enough pointy thing that you can poke your enemies with, with more deadly, you know, intent than just poking. And so what I'm trying to describe here is a situation in which the utility and function of a javelin is actually superior to that of a bow. It's not a superior ranged weapon, mainly because of its range, but for the transition between ranged combat to melee combat, it is a profoundly more effective weapon because you can do both with it, and even if you throw all your javelins, you still would have another hand to protect yourself in which you can quickly draw your main weapon, whether that's a sword or anything else. And so with this logic explored and understood a bit better, it really does make more sense for a dedicated melee soldier to have a couple of ranged thrown weapons on his person as backup to be able to throw at an enemy who's charging him, and end the engagement before his life is even put at real risk. But this doesn't mean that the only situation in which a javelin or javelin-like weapon would be useful is if you had a shield. Not at all, there is a lot of utility and usefulness in having a ranged weapon in which you can use it without needing an additional tool for it to be effective. In regards to a bow and arrow or a crossbow, if the crossbow or bow breaks, your arrows or bolts become rather useless on their own. With javelins, you don't need anything else apart from yourself to employ them effectively in combat, which also makes them a viable and effective choice in a combat situation even when other ranged weapons like bows and arrows are available. So then, why did they disappear? Why did this logic disappear? Well, the answer is, of course, it didn't. Javelins didn't so much disappear from the historical battlefield as much as they evolved, or got a significant and rather cool upgrade. Now, the upgrades are, of course, fletching at the back and something a bit more substantial at the tip. Why would you want those things? They seem fairly evident, but I am gonna break it down and go through it. When you throw a javelin, okay, there is actually a chance that if you, you know, get your throw, you know, it's a bit wonky and you didn't do a good job, that the tip will fall, you know, fall away from the point that you're aiming at and it can actually flip or move around. And if you ever throw a javelin, well, and I, you know, of course I have, when I first did, I remember way back in high school, we were doing javelin Olympics and all that stuff. I was amazed at how difficult it was to get the tip to stay on point, okay? You would throw the javelin and kind of land back first and flip or go over and stuff like that. And it took a little bit of coordination to actually throw it in the right way that it would fly true. Of course, the simple and evident way to fix this is to add fletching on the back, okay? If you try and throw one of these things, like a javelin, with fletching, 
Even if you have to do a really bad throw, it's going to solve correct and fly straight. And a steel or iron head on this thing? Well, of course, just increases its lethality. So that's the weapon, that's kind of the deconstructed logical progression to reach its development. Now let's have a look at how they fit into history, because Whenever, you know, movies, video games, TV shows, even role-playing games are depicting the medieval period, I have not once seen this kind of weapon. Yet, from artistic record, it is literally surprising. I was, I was shocked at how many, you know, artistic depictions there are showcasing these weapons. They're they were very, very common in the medieval period. So common, in fact, that the war dart or javelin really should be considered in the classical catalogue of medieval weapons. You got sword, you got axe, you got maces, you got war hammers, you got pole arms. Well, add in war darts and war javelins. They belong in this same group. What were they used for? Funny question this, okay? Because uh, there are some direct indications from artistic record, but a lack of evidence, meaning a lack of evidence being used in any other situation, isn't evidence to the contrary conclusion, okay? It doesn't mean that we can leap to that contrary conclusion that, well, these were clearly used in these other areas where we don't really have evidence for, but we don't have evidence excluding it. And so in those realms, I feel we can just use logical analysis to try and figure out, well, you know, that probably would be effective in these other areas. Well, what are the areas in which uh, the medieval artwork shows these weapons being used. Hunting, naval warfare, and sieges by the look of it. Obviously one of the uh, weaknesses of these weapons is range. They are, their range is only as far as you can throw them, and so a good bow will outshoot you, but their damage potential, because of their, you know, size, would be fairly significant. Just by looking at them, they don't seem like they'd be particularly effective against armoured opponents. Of course, the type of, I was going to say arrowhead, it's not really arrowhead, so, so spearhead, javel, javelin head, dart head thing, would determine how effective it is against different types of armors. If you have kind of like, you know, a bodkin type head on it, uh, much more effective against armor, but it seems to be that this, the more common uh, head for these war darts, as shown in the medieval artwork and stuff, is something a bit broader, okay? Indeed, like a broad head. And those are the type of heads you use on arrows and things similar to it against well, animals for one, and uh, lightly armoured opponents, because once that thing gets in and hits internal organs, it's going to be cutting and doing more slicing and stuff like that, doing more damage, harder to feel heal from. And you know, it would be interesting to see how effective it would be against a properly made gambeson. Now, I don't think that were the only realms these weapons could have only been used in history. I think, you know, there could be many things, like straight on battlefield. We do have uh, artistic pictures of them being used, what looks to be on battlefields as well. Were they ever used as a melee kind of weapon substitute in the same vein that javelins can be used as a melee weapon substitute because, you know, they're substantial enough. Some of they do seem kind of like this one in the hunting one. They seem fairly close, like they're just coming up and skewering them. So these weapons could be kind of also used as small like spears. They're pretty cool and they were far, far more common than many people realize. This is a classic medieval weapon. So guys, role-playing games, you know, if you're ever writing for TVs, movies, or whatnot, stuff like that. Uh, you know, video game developers, if you're there. War javelins! These are prominent if you want, so it seems like if you want to accurately depict medieval combat and warfare, war javelins need to be a must, okay? I'm not saying that they were more prominent than swords or something like that. Swords, very, very common. Bows and arrows, I think, were probably more common than war javelins. But in terms of how common other weapons, like maces, okay, they were not nearly as common as other weapons because they were a more specialized type of weapon. But that's the same vein as these war javelins. Bit more specialized, bit more, you know, focused in for uh, specific uses but definitely present and known of being very common in the medieval period. So there you go, guys. This has been War Javelins, underappreciated historic weapons. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. And of course, I hope to see you next time. So until then, farewell.